Welcome everyone, I'm Spiro. Thanks for tuning in. I'm very excited to have Dr. Paul Connett joining me today, who holds a PhD in chemistry and specializes in environmental toxicology. Now, Dr. Paul Conant is a member of the Fluoride Action Network, who is currently suing the Environmental Protection Agency to end water fluoridation in the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, this is such a landmark case in which I consider to be the trial of the century uh, at this point. Uh, Dr. Conant, thank you for taking the time to be my guest today. Well, thank you, Sparrow. Now, Dr. Conant, amidst all this crazy chaos going on all over the world and in this country. Uh, this is perhaps the most important event taking place behind the scenes that many people are unaware of. Uh, and it affects all of us, regardless of your political affiliation, race, or religion. And there is zero coverage of this in the, al in the mainstream media. The only coverage I'm seeing is in the alternative media. Now, would you agree with me that this is perhaps the trial of the century? Well, yes, I would say so in terms of environmental health and the health of our children. We're talking about the deliberate addition of a substance which damages the brain. That's our case, that fluoride damages the brain. And we've got some of the best scientists in the world having done some of the best studies done on this issue to testify to that effect. So we're talking about an issue in which a brain damaging substance is being deliberately added to the drinking water of about 200 million Americans and worldwide about 400 million people, many of whom are children. And of course, as far as pregnant women are concerned, many of the creatures that are getting this are the, the fetus, highly susceptible. And so we have been presenting these studies. Um, these studies were published in major journals like the JAMA Pediatrics, like um, Environmental Health Perspectives, which is the journal of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. These studies were being done by the leading neurotoxicologists in the world. The studies were financed by the US government agencies like the National Institute of Health. I can't think of anything more substantial than the evidence that we have, not just animal studies, not just what we call ecological studies. We have many ecological studies from China, which compared the IQ of children in the uh, villages where there was high fluoride exposure with low fluoride exposure. No, these studies are cohort studies. These are prospective cohort studies where they have individual measurements. They have individual measurements of the mother's exposure to fluoride as measured by fluoride levels in their urine, and they have individual measurements of the IQ of their offspring, both at four years of age and later in one study at six to 12 years of age. And these studies were done both in Mexico City and in Canadian cities. I mean, every single base that you could think of, every single criticism that has been um, given by the promoters of fluoridation over the last 20 odd years, everything's taken care of. And yet, as you said, none of the major newspapers have covered this. I'm sure after it's all finished, if we lose, it will be headlines. It will be headlines. And if we win, it will be ignored. And the New York Times and the other lousy journals in this country, lousy in terms of telling the truth on science, on the science of this particular issue, I'll go into that in a moment, because the science editor of the New York Times is a person called Donald McNeil Jr., whose father actually wrote a book promoting fluoridation and celebrating fluoridation many years ago. And as far as Donald McNeil Jr. is concerned, the senior science editor of the New York Times, this issue was resolved in the 1950s. I mean, that's the kind of unprofessional crap that is dished out by a journal that is highly respected on other issues, highly respected on social, political worldwide events and so on. But on this issue, you're looking at an Achilles heel as far as professionalism is concerned. And of course, a lot of the other media in this country take their, their cues from the New York Times, the Washington Post, and, and a handful of others. And to me, it's, it's very frustrating. It's very, very sad. 
Uh, now, Dr. Conant, uh, because of this uh, crisis of the COVID lockdowns, this trial is actually being streamed live on Zoom. And I'll be sure to leave a link uh, to the website, your website there, the fluoridealert.org website in the show notes so people can actually watch this trial as it unfolds for themselves. Now, I understand this trial is expected to last around two weeks, and the first week just concluded. Now, uh, I understand that you may be limited on what you can and cannot say because the trial is still ongoing, but can you please share what transpired over the, the last week and uh, what is in store for the, this next upcoming week? Yes, it, this is probably the one good thing that's come out of the COVID-19 crisis, Spiro, because our view of this trial is so much clearer than it would have been had we gone to court in person. We actually, my wife and I, did hear a preliminary hearing in this case, and we could neither see the judge very well nor hear him very well, and nor could we hear the lawyers completely. The, the sound was not good. But on this Zoom, you get perfect pictures of the judge and the lawyers and the witnesses. And so it's a, a first class history. It's, it's, it's history in the making. So I really do urge people to watch this. It's absolutely fascinating. Well, the first week was devoted to our case and we brought forward superb witnesses. We had Howard Hugh who was the principal investigator of the Bashash studies. These were the studies done in Mexico City, which found in a strong association between the level of exposure to fluoride of pregnant women and lowered IQ in their children. And in the second study, an, an association between the exposure of the pregnant women to fluoride during pregnancy and increased symptoms of ADHD, two very important findings. So Hugh testified first, and then we had um, Philip Grandjean, who is world-renowned as a neurotoxicologist. He is the, the go-to person from the EPA, go-to person for information on mercury's toxicity. It was his classic study in the Faroe Islands, which established the base for regulating mercury consumption of fish and so on for the EPA. So here is this world expert, and he has taken these same skills and applied them to analyzing the fluoride literature. He himself, with his co-workers, published a meta-review of the IQ studies that were available in 2012. And there they looked at the Chinese studies, and, and these were, as I said before, these were um, what we call ecological studies. They were based on uh, location. You compare a high fluoride village with a low fluoride village, but you don't have individual measurements. So these are the weakest epidemiological studies. Even so, when they did this meta-analysis of 27 studies, they recognized weaknesses. They didn't have all the information that they wanted. But what was astounding is that out of these 27 studies, 26 of them found a relationship. The higher the fluoride exposure in the kids, the lower the IQ. The kids had a lower IQ in the high fluoride villages compared to the low fluoride village. An astounding consistency. And that was very striking. So that was the background of Grand Jean. And we asked him to update his review of the literature and do something that he helped to pioneer which is a risk assessment called the BD, BMDL, Benchmark Dose Level, Limit. Sorry, Benchmark Dose Limit. And this is basically, you can do this if you have a lot of data and it falls into a linear relationship, as it did in both the Mexico City and the Canadian studies from Canada. Uh, the, the Bashar studies were published in 2017. Green was published in 2019 and another study by Till in 2020. OK, if there's a linear relationship, you can do the EPA's preferred methodology, which is called a BDML analysis. He did that. As I said, he pioneered this technique and he came to the conclusion that a safe reference dose to protect children from a lowering of one IQ point, if you, that's what people are concerned about, 
A loss of one IQ point makes a difference of about $18,000 of income over a lifetime. It is the point of departure of concern for the EPA. They talk about one to two IQ points. But to be absolutely safe, you would want to protect the whole population from a loss of one IQ point. Well, well what level did he find in um, the urine of mothers was 0.15 milligrams per liter you would need to keep below that level to in order to protect the iq of children and that dose would be achieved by someone drinking one glass of water of fluoridated water 0.15 in other words based upon i, I mean this <laughs> spiro this study we're talking about these studies went through intense peer review the editors of these prestigious journals knew that they were dealing with controversial issues. And so they went through double, triple the normal peer review, the statistical analysis they went through. And the journal of um, JAMA Pediatrics, one of the leading journals of pediatrics in the world, their editors were so impressed with these findings after this intense scrutiny that they invited David Bellinger, another neurotoxicologist, world famous for lead, uh, to review this study, uh, to write an editorial. They themselves wrote an editorial, and they also had a podcast, in which a 20-minute podcast in which they expressed their enormous uh, concern because they had hitherto gone along with the brainwashed majority of medical associations in this country and Canada, that fluoridation was safe and effective, safe and effective, safe and effective. They didn't, they weren't aware of any of the health studies because they, it's very difficult to get these, any harm published. But this one was, and, and the fact that it lowered IQ by this amount, by about the same amount as lead. I mean, we have this, you, you know how people are concerned about the neurotoxicity of lead, which is an, an additive to gasoline. Why aren't the people that are so concerned about that in Flint, Michigan and other places, that level of lead, why aren't you concerned not about an additive to gasoline or an unwanted contaminant of water, but something that we deliberately add to the water supply? The, the contradiction, the, the double standard in all of this is just so extreme but it's based upon ignorance. That's the thing. The, the people that promote this don't keep up with the literature. The people that um, uh, uh, the professional bodies don't keep up with it. The health departments, they just repeat this mantra that fluoridation is safe and effective, safe and effective. Sorry, I didn't mean to go into a rant. You asked me what had happened last week. Well, we had the testimony of Hugh. We had Grand Jean's risk assessment. Then we had the testimony of Bruce Lanfear, who was co-author of the Green Study and the Till Study. And, and he, he... Just as Grandjean is the go-to man at the EPA for Mercury's neurotoxicity, Lamphere is the go-to man for the EPA on lead's neurotoxicity. And he went through his studies. So really convincing stuff. And then we had yet another expert, Kathleen Thiessen, who is, um, has served on many panels. She was part of the famous uh, National Research Council Review of 2006, which remains one of the most comprehensive review of uh, fluoride's toxicity ever done. And she actually wrote about a third of that report. Anyway, she did a risk assessment based upon the animal studies. In my view, it's not necessary. Human studies trump animal studies. Animal studies are useful to, to underline the plausibility of what you're looking at. We've got those in spades. Um, so really, the fact that we've got such high-quality human studies, prospective cohort studies done in different countries, um, should trump everything. But however, we, if you like, gilded the lily, and we had the animal risk assessment, and her reference doses are easily exceeded by children 
virtually everywhere. Bottle-fed children easily exceed every single... She did it five different ways, and her reference doses were exceeded in, in every case. Now, what we have to come, Spiro, is next week. We've just got into, on Friday, we've just got into the EPA's expert witnesses. Now, they have one very good expert witness, and that is Christina Thayer, who works for the EPA. Very bright, young, very bright, and we work with her. In fact, she did a review of the animal, or she was headed up a national toxicology program review of the animal toxicity, and also is part of a human review of the human stuff. That's another story, because that has not been finalized. But other than that, the EPA, for its expert witnesses, are using exponent, exponent. Most people in the field of toxicology know what exponent is. It's a defender of industrial interests. Their job is to obscure the obvious, to... <coughs> to confused to do analyses which come, it's like, it's like tobacco lobby, tobacco lobby, and the, the lead in gasoline, the, the, they, they use experts which muddy the waters, um, try to confuse people. Anyway, our, some of our experts have actually clashed with their exponent witnesses in the past. Grangin clashed with Chang, who's the expert on human toxicology, supposedly, he clashed with her a couple of years ago on PFAs, uh, a case which the plaintiffs won against uh, pollutants, a polluting company. I think it was DuPont. So uh, anybody who's watched the movie um, Dark Waters is, is all about that particular case. But Grand Jean was on the side of the good guys and Chang was on the side of the bad guys defending PFAs, if you please, the, the dioxins of the 21st century, no problem, no harm, according to Exponent, according to Chang. And then the other expert is um, uh, Tutsi, um, uh, uh, another expert. She is the expert on animal toxicology, and she's defended the toxicity of arsenic uh, for the mining industry and the, the, the you know various production in industries which use news arsenic. So you, I ask you, Spiro, why is the US EPA using taxpayers' money, at least $200,000, maybe probably more like a million dollars, using taxpayers' money to defend this outdated practice? Don't, don't you smell a rat here? Well, uh, I would say that based on everything that I have researched and everything that you guys who are the experts have, have researched and, and you feel confident enough uh, with the science on your side to build a case and actually take the EPA to task, which has never been done before and is only allowed uh, because of a loophole, basically because of a, you know, a, the EPA uh, kind of uh, slipped up in the past and which actually opened the door for this lawsuit, uh, which I'm going to, we, we discussed a couple years ago yourself, uh, Dr. Paul Conant, and your brilliant son, uh, Michael Conant, who is an attorney uh, with the Fluoride Action Network. Uh, we did an, an, an interview a couple years ago, and it delves deeply into the case and even the science, which I'm going to leave a link for below. That way people can really delve more into uh, this case as you guys have been preparing for this for years at this point. And Dr. Conant, you are a highly qualified expert who has been fighting uh, the deliberate addition of fluoride in the water supply for many, many years. And you've spoken all over the world um, in trying to inform people about the potentially harmful health impacts of consuming fluoridated water. And now you guys uh, are taking on the EPA, uh, you know, and a lot of people would argue that p perhaps the judicial system has been compromised on some levels. And when we see these, these agencies 
It's well known, for example, that the FDA, uh, there's a revolving door between big pharmaceutical and the FDA, for example, and so that would only lead us to believe that, you know, we'd have to look at this uh, with a speculative eye, essentially, on, you know, what kind of special interests may have influence over, over uh, you know, these government agencies, because it's not unprecedented. This has happened, you know, before in the past, and, uh, you know, I, I just really... Uh, commend the work that you guys are doing over there and uh, I really hope that people make their way over to the Fluoride Action Network which is the uh, fluoridealert.org uh, and and watch these uh, trials watch this trial as it unfolds live it's it's unbelievable to be able to do this we should have been able to do this long ago because it's extremely transparent at this point and you know so essentially at this first week, you guys presented your case against fluoride, and now the government is beginning to present their case. What what do you see taking place uh, here in the next week? Well, basically, these um, these uh, industry pro industry consultants are going to do their best to build a fortress around this policy. They are going to say that there is this technique called systematic review, a systematic analysis, where you have to go through excruciating lengths to classify, grade each study that you want to review, whether it's animal study or human study. There is this very complex review process, and you've got to go through all of this uh, before you can get to the point of establishing that fluoride is a is a hazard. So you ignore these high quality studies and you, you have to get down into these weeds. Now, I want to say a thing about that because you're correct. TUSCA, the Toxic Substances Control, Control Act, does allow the opportunity for citizens and, and NGOs to, to petition the EPA to say to the EPA, this special use of a toxic substance is a, a danger to the to the public and certainly to subsets of the population and that you should ban it. You should ba ban this specific use. So we can do that. Now, we did do that. And the, the EPA refused our petition based on, they said, the science, which allowed us to take them to federal court, hence the, the current situation. Now, the object of having that clause in there that citizens can take these issues to the EPA is part of democracy, isn't it? it, it there has to be a way that citizens can challenge bureaucracies. And yet now what is coming out in this case is that according to these, these um, pro-industry experts, the only way you can do that involves a process which might cost the citizens a million dollars to do. So in other words, the very way that they are trying to address the what is needed to establish an unreasonable risk is not the, the evidence that we've presented, which I think does it in spades. Clearly, it's a hazard. We've got hundreds of animal studies. We've got 64 IQ studies. We've got these prospective cohort studies. We've got biochemical studies. It's clear that fluoride is a neurotoxic hazard. And that the human, these well-conducted human studies, clearly indicates it's a risk at the levels at which we're exposed to. And finally, isn't it an unreasonable risk when people don't have to swallow fluoride to get its benefits? You can use fluoridated toothpaste and so on. Our case is, is pretty obvious. But these scientists, these industry consultants, exponent, are going to now try to say that unless you do the systematic review, you can't prove that a substance is an unreasonable risk. Well, wait a moment. How, uh, Michael, my son, who's the lawyer in this case, he asked Christine Teo that knows about the systematic review. Well, how many systematic reviews has the EPA ever done, completed on any toxic substance? You know what the answer is? Zero. They, they are asking us to do something that they have never done. And what's worse, 
the National Toxicology Program that's taken three and a half years to do a systematic review on this subject, who helped to define the process, Spiro. When they produced a draft report, there was a, 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 um, a committee from the National Academy of Sciences who said the NTP did not go through the protocols that they have established. So even the NTP can't even use this machinery in this particular case. But we, citizens, are supposed to somehow find a million dollars or more to do this, which the NTP couldn't do, which the EPA hasn't done a single time yet, in order to, to get across the obvious fact that fluoride damages the brain and we shouldn't be putting it in the drinking water. Any person on the street could tell you that if you've established that something poses a risk to the infant and fetal brain, you don't put it in the bloody water. An average person knows that. But what we're going to see next week are people misusing their intelligence, misusing their brains, because somebody is paying them a couple of hundred thousand dollars to obfuscate the issue. That, in a nutshell, is what you can see in living color next week. Well, it certainly sounds like a, a classic David against a Goliath uh, scenario here. Uh, well, you know, we do see, you know, that not only would they be misusing their brains, but they, I would say misrepresenting their interests, uh, you know, or misrepresenting their, their positions, I should say, to uh, represent special interests, it seems, because, you know, if there is one agency that you would think would be tasked to take care of these kind of studies to verify the safety of the public and of the environment, it would be the Environmental Protection Agency, in my view. I mean, that would be taxpayer money actually well spent for once. <laughs> yeah, they haven't done it. They haven't done it. You know, we had, last week, we had two people on there. We had Joyce Donahue, who's head of the Office of Water, or at least the spokesman for fluoride from the Office of Water. And it's clear that they have done nothing. They have done nothing to pursue this issue. Even though they are in charge of establishing the safe drinking water, they have done nothing since 1986 to change that dreadful standard of four parts per million. Won't go into the numbers here, but it's a ridiculously unscientific standard. They have done nothing, nothing. And it was clear in a cross-examination. And then they had the head of the oral health division of the CDC. Uh, to put those people in perspective, it's on these people that the world quotes, the world quotes every day. Some journalist, some editor quotes somewhere in the world that fluoridation is one of the top public health achievements of the 20th century. That's what is quoted nearly every day somewhere in the world. That has its origin in this oral health division, about 30 people. Uh, the CDC has about 30,000 employees, but this is the oral health division. Their job is to promote fluoridation. And they know nothing. They know nothing about the neurotoxicity of fluoride. And in his deposition, um, the head of this division, it made very clear he knows nothing about the neurotoxicity of fluoride, but it doesn't make any difference, Spiro. They still promote it. But here's the good news. Let me do the good news. The judge is, is very, very bright. It's clear that he's following every, every nuance of our testimony. So this is good. He's bright and he's following very closely. I, I don't think there's, that this man will be distracted from the truth. I really don't. And the other thing is our witnesses have been superb, incredibly impressive. And your reader, your viewers, I'm sorry, your viewers right now have a treat in store. If they haven't seen last week, just uh, be patient because a few weeks from now, or, or maybe earlier than that, we will have a videotape uh, I hope actually two videotapes. One will be the whole thing, the whole thing with only, you know, silly things edited out so people can see the whole trial. And then there will be an edited highlights of the trial, which will not be done in um, 
you know, partisan way. It would just, well, I, I guess it would be, you could say it's partisan because we, we will bring out the strongest points that were made in the case. And that would be a huge education, especially for people that are on the fence, especially for people that have, have t- looked down their noses at us for so many years. And I would remind you, Spiro, as far as my personal, you know, I'm not an expert witness in this. Um, and the reason that we didn't use me and some other people is that we are known to be partisan on this. So once it's very difficult not to be partisan once you know the science. And so our experts are so powerful because before their research, they hadn't taken a position on fluoridation. This is particularly true of Howard Hugh and Bruce Lanfear, known in their own right as scientists with integrity and enormous skill. It's on their testimony. And we were impressed. And I'm sure the court was impressed. So, yeah, that's the good news. That's the good news. Dr. Paul Conant, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be my guest today. I know that you're extremely busy. You guys are right in the middle of the most important trial, I think, that is taking place uh, that I have... I mean, this is this is a landmark case, the case of the century, in my view. Uh, ladies and de- gentlemen, Dr. Paul Conant of the Fluoride Action Network, please be sure to share and support this incredibly important information in this fight that these brave men and women are taking up on our behalf. Uh, you know, you guys have been working tirelessly for years to affect real tangible positive change with no hidden agendas or ulterior motives. This is for the genuine public health, you know, the in you guys are going up against a system which is often stacked against us. And uh... Actually, and I want to say this for me was a dream come true. Uh, win or lose, win or lose, this was a dream come true. I wanted our science to be heard on a level playing field, on a level playing field, not to have it be determined by people who have an agenda, who have a policy. It's been us against power, us against agencies that are, have a policy protect. That doesn't operate in this case, Spiro. If the judge, the court listens to both sides. We present our science. They will present their version of the science. And then on a level playing field, the court will decide whether or not fluoride poses an unreasonable risk to the mental development of our children. And that is uh, your side of the case and the government's or the EPA side of the case is that this is uh, one of the greatest health achievements in history because of what exactly? Because it prevents tooth decay or, or what is their argument exactly? Yeah, you know, I think the EPA left to itself would probably have got rid of this policy a long time ago. But they have to regulate the so-called safe levels of fluoride in water, along with everything else, you know, lead, arsenic, and so on. And all the time they've been doing that, for many, many decades, they've been looking over their shoulder to a much larger body, namely the National Institute of Health. The National Institute of Health has promoted this policy for over 70 years. And so the EPA is sort of acted as a loyal soldier, a loyal associate. I mean, if the NIH thinks it's a good policy, well, who are we? You know, who are we to challenge it? That seems to be, the, that's the impression that I've had looking at these these guys. And the same with the FDA. The FDA could have spoken up on this years ago. All they've said is that it's, um, as far as adding fluoride to the water, it's an unregulated uh, t- uh, drug. It's, it's not an approved drug. That's what the FDA says. But they don't step in and say, well, you shouldn't be putting an unapproved drug into the drinking water. And as I've told you, the CDC, only in the form of this subdivision, it, the oral health division, promotes this practice. They are the promoter. And they don't take any responsibility the, of this safety, the health harm that this could be doing. It, it's just... It's an un- unbelievable situation. I've written a book about this, as you know. That uh, book was published in 2010. Uh, not much has changed, except one thing has changed, and that is that when we published that book in 2010, 
there were 23 IQ studies. Now there are 65, including some of the best design studies that you can get in the field of epidemiology. Well, I genuinely, I really, uh, really encourage all of the viewers to make your way over to fluoridealert.org where you can see the live stream of the trial as it unfolds. Watch for yourself, see for yourself, and decide for yourself. And I also encourage people to go back to that interview from two years ago uh, as the Fluoride Action Network was preparing their case. And, and I did an incredible interview with uh, my guest here today, Dr. Paul Conant and his son, Michael Conant, who was an attorney in this case. It gets way, way more in-depth into fluoride and, and all of these issues including the health uh, impacts and and it, it, it's a really incredible interview that I is still just as current today as it was two years ago now dr. Paul Conant on behalf of all of us I, I do salute you and your team and wish you the best of luck and please come back again uh, with an update we'll do any anytime Spiro anytime you want okay thank you so much sir and then just one thing you yes. know I come across with a lot of passion and it's so easy to misinterpret that passion as being unscientific yeah to be passionate is not what you normally associate with science but i want the science this is my ideal this court case is my ideal in the sense that the science will be examined dispassionately objectively the judgment will be based on the quality of the science and i'm all for that the passion that you hear is the frustration of having taken 24, 24 years to get to this point and to have all the, the lack of, of in, integrity from these uh, regulatory agencies. We pay these bodies, we pay the EPA, we pay the FDA, we pay the CDC, we pay the NIH. The lack of integrity in there and then the lack of professionalism of the media. This is what winds me up. This is what makes me frustrated and passionate. But please, viewer, don't assume that this at its core is not based on science, honest, decent science. And I'm glad that there are other scientists who are making that clear in this case. Anyway, so long for now. I'll see you soon. Thank you, uh, Dr. Paul Connor. You're always welcome, and I look forward to uh, seeing the rest of this trial as it plays out. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.